Lindsay Clark's novel, The Chemical Wedding, won the Whitbread Prize. And among his other works are masterful and acclaimed retellings of the tales of the Iliad and also of the medieval legend of Parsifal and the Holy Grail. Of his most recent novel, The Water Theatre, the Times reviewer said, Lindsay's most recent novel, it is huge in scope, in energy, in heart. It is difficult to remember a recent book that is at once so beautiful and yet so thought-provoking. It's an enormous and exciting privilege to have such a distinguished writer with us this evening. So please, can we all welcome Lindsay Clark. me, beautiful and thought-provoking. <laughs> uh, because I'm under strict instruction to speak for slightly less than 10 minutes about imagination, language and Rosie, I thought I'd better write a few things down so that I didn't uh, uh, start to ramble. Uh, so bear with me please while I read. It's great to see how many of you have been drawn by friendship and the love of poetry to be here tonight to hear two poets read from their work on the eve of National Poetry Day. I believe that Percy Bysshe Shelley would be well pleased with us all. And I believe it because of something he wrote in his defense of poetry, which is still essential reading for anyone who takes a serious interest in the art. Among the other inspiring and provocative things he said, there was this. The cultivation of poetry is never more to be desired than at periods when from an excess of the selfish and calculating principle, the accumulation of the materials of external life exceed the quantity of the power of assimilating them to the internal laws of human nature. What I think he means are times when people's lives are stuffed with more things than they need or can properly digest. And there's not much doubt that our time qualifies on that score. As for an excess of the selfish and calculating principle, well, given the daily scramble for power, profit and celebrity depicted in the media, it seems we score quite highly on that one too. But why should Shelley think that the cultivation of poetry might be a countervailing remedy for the greedy spin and jangle of times such as these? Was it merely the self-delusion of a romantic poet with his head in the clouds? Or was he onto something important something we need to remember, which is that poetry is powerful, more powerful than it appears to be. A good poem can touch the heart and shake it. It can do what the archaic statue of Apollo did to Milka, look back at us and say, you must change your life. And I think poetry can do this because a good poem is a mysterious thing. Where does such a poem come from? Why can we not just summon one at will? Why does it move us so, and how does it do it? In my own attempt to understand something about the nature of poetry, I came up with this. A poem speaks from the soul, to the soul, through the senses, in a way which subtly evades the ego's efforts of control. It's an enterprise of the heart, and of the breath, perhaps of the entire human metabolism. Sometimes I think that to write a poem, and even to read one properly, is to enter an alert state of emptiness in which the illusory boundary which seems to separate us from all else is suspended for a time, and there is no division between inner and outer, conscious and unconscious, perceiver and perceived. And if this is true, then there is a virginity to such experience, and the language which emerges from it will have a primal quality, something perhaps close to the way our early ancestors thought and spoke when names were first found for things, a language that speaks in images 
rather than in concepts. What I'm thinking of is a language that is transparent in its immediacy to lived experience and is essentially different in nature to the kind of language that tends to call the shots these days in many walks of life. I mean that taste for abstraction which comes up with phrases from which our senses instinctively recoil. Phrases like engineering deliverable outcomes or degrading the enemy's resources or the notorious collateral damage. Phrases in which the words are stacked like breeze box designed to obscure experience rather than reveal it. It's a way of wielding language which gives its users a heady sense of power and leaves those who do not speak it feeling impotent and confused. In recent times, a lot of literary criticism has been written that way, and it's largely impenetrable to those uninitiated in its obfuscating rhetoric. But other professions have, become, have developed their own varieties of abstract jargon too, and the rage for it has become so contagious that even in common usage, people now utter such clumsy abstractions as on a daily basis, because it somehow sounds more official and authoritative than our parents did when they said daily or every day. I hear a lot about these bases on which people seem to be doing things these days, but I don't recall ever having seen one. <laughs> Poetry is different. It may be in love with metaphor, but it also likes to call a spade a spade. And because it wants to excite the imagination and strike an echo in the heart, it has small use for the left brain abstractions that so appeal to the clever mind and now dominate so much of our activity and thought. Wittgenstein said, our language is our world. And if we are to change our world in a way that makes it more responsive to the living quick of the natural order on which our existence depends, as well as to the deep needs of our own bewildered souls, then we are going to need a language which speaks through the compassionate imagination with a more flexible voice. And to learn that kind of language, we must listen to our poets.